Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, March 3rd. And on behalf of everyone at Simulations Plus, we welcome you to today's webinar, Clinical Dilly and State of the Art Solutions. Presenting this afternoon will be Dr. Liesl Shoda and Paul B. Watkins. An opportunity to ask questions will follow today's presentation. You may send your written questions using the questions pane on your control panel, or you may use the hand raising icon on your control panel to ask your questions directly. Please be sure to enter the unique audio pin displayed when you join the call. This call is being recorded for playback on www.simulations-plus.com. Before we get started with the presentations today, we have a quick poll question. Do you use modeling and simulation in your current research activities? We're going to give you about 30 seconds to answer the question. Just a few more seconds here before we close it. Wonderful, thank you for your participation. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Brett Howe. Brett is the president of DillySim Services, developing and using DillySim and other software tools to improve the development of safer and more effective drug therapies. He is also the associate director of the DillySim Initiative since its inception in 2011. Thank you, Arlene. And thanks to everyone for joining our webinar today, Clinical Daily and State-of-the-Art Solutions. Um, I'm delighted that you all will get to hear from Dr. Watkins and Dr. Shota today um, regarding our DillySim technology. And as we dive into the presentation, I'd like to take a minute just to cover a couple of transition slides. Um, first of all, here on slide two, uh, I just want to remind you all that the Simulations Plus family of companies, which includes Simulations Plus, Cognigen and Dillison Services, offers a wide array of software and solutions covering the drug development process. Um, we have products that focus on uh, machine learning, absorption and PBPK modeling, QSP and QST modeling, as well as clinical pharmacokinetics and PKPD modeling. And we offer all of these solutions in the form of both services and software. And you, perhaps you may have seen just today, we announced the acquisition of Lixoft a company that offers the Monolix suite of software tools. So we've expanded even more the Simulations Plus family and our offerings, as well as expanding our geographic footprint into Europe. So we're excited about that and we hope you'll contact us about our solutions. DillySim Services of our division will be the focus of today's presentation with DillySim, our drug-induced liver injury product, being the focus of the webinar, as well as clinical liver injury in general. However, I just want to remind you all that in the area of toxicology, we also have a focus on kidney injury with our Renison platform and a focus on pharmacology with our idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, NAFLD and NASH, radiation, and not pictured here, but recently um, uh, a new recent focus for us is heart failure as well. So we have a number of QST and QSP solutions and programs. We would love to hear from you and set up consultation with you to discuss you know, needs you may have in this area. Now, without further ado, I want to introduce our speakers today. Our first speaker, Dr. Paul Watkins, really needs no introduction. He's a world-renowned hepatologist, one of the top drug-induced liver injury consultants in the world. Um, Paul is the director of the Institute for Drug Safety Sciences and the Howard Q. Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. He serves as a co-chair of the steering committee for the U.S. Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network. Dr. Watkins is also the recipient of numerous honors and awards including the Rawls Palmer Award for Progress in Medicine from the American Society for Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics and the Career Award from the Toxicology Section of the American Society of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics. Now, our second speaker today will be Dr. Liesl Shoda. She's been with our group for a long time, is a, is a, is a, is a very important part and leader in the group. 
Dr. Shota focus, research focuses on predicting and improving the understanding of drug action on innate and adaptive immune responses. Currently, Dr. Shota is leading an effort to represent the contribution of the adaptive immune response to drug-induced liver injury in the DILISIM model platform, as well as leading model development efforts across several additional QSP platforms and leading contributing to consulting projects at the same time. Now, prior to joining DILISIM services, Dr. Shota worked for over 10 years at Intellos Incorporated, modeling type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and other areas. She earned her PhD in wildlife science and fisheries from Texas A&M University and received her bachelor's degree in zoology from Duke University. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Watkins. All right, great. Uh, Brett, everybody can hear me? Good. Yep, sounds good. All right, that's good. Yeah, so um, of course, like all of you, I'm doing this from my home. And uh, I hope everyone's safe out there. I saw a statistic of the increase in the filing for divorce in China and now apparently in Italy. And I think I can understand that trend, having been home now for almost two weeks, but things are going well. Anyway, so the clip, next time I have the next slide. So I do chair the Scientific Advisory Committee, and I get some money for that. And I have a financial interest in the success of Dillysome Services that actually will end uh, in two months, uh, for full disclosure, next. Uh, this is uh, the experience of AstraZeneca. And although it's a few years old, in my own experience, it's pretty representative across the industry uh, today, although the experience differs from one country to another. And what's shown here in the red bars uh, is the um, uh, the failure of drugs before they go into the clinic. Um, and then in the tan bars is the failures once they're in clinic. So the relative height really addresses the accuracy of preclinical or non-clinical screening to detect the toxicities. And you can see cardiovascular is the, is the biggest problem, where both uh, preclinically or non-clinically and um, clinically, there are uh, the most failures. But of course, this is a very large category that includes um, cardiomyopathies, which is something that the team has now uh, uh, begun to model in collaboration with a, a large drug company, uh, but also atherosclerosis and all kinds of arrhythmias, prolonged QT, et cetera. It's a huge, uh, huge area. And second, I think still it's going to be the liver, where it's a major reason for drugs to never make it into clinic. But the preclinical screening is, is not perfect. And there are uh, drugs that go on into the clinic and then uh, fail because of liver safety. And if you hit it again, I just make the point that the other um, toxicity that can lead to an organ failure that we're not very good preclinically at detecting and have both preclinical and clinical failures is uh, kidney toxicity. Next slide. So um, actually, the FDA is very proud of the fact that now in a decade and a half, uh, there have been no drugs approved that have been permanently withdrawn from the market in the U.S. due to liver safety concerns. And, um, and you know, they're very proud of this. And I guess one interpretation is that drug developers and regulators are smarter than they used to be, but and in part that's true. Uh, but I think that in reality, the real reason, if you hit the uh, mouse again, is that they're demanding larger and bigger clinical trials to, if there's any liver safety concern, they now want um, large clinical trial experience, unless the drug meets some overwhelming unmet medical need. Um, and, and there have been many examples of that. If you hit, if you go to the next slide, one that's not current uh, was really with Resolin, of course, troglitazone, sort of the poster child of a drug that was withdrawn uh, because of acute liver failure and liver transplants. It was approved in 1997, but at that time, less than a thousand patients, and this is diabetes, were treated uh, for uh, six months. And of course, now if you're coming up with a new treatment for a diabetes, you'd have to treat a whole lot more people and then go into phase four. Uh, cardiovascular outcome studies. And just by comparison, rivaroxaban uh, was approved, the oral uh, anticoagulant. 
uh, not until 60,000 patients had been exposed to the drug. And really, the liver safety was only in question because first in class thymelogatrin, which didn't even have the same mechanism, uh, was uh, withdrawn from worldwide markets. So next slide. So this remains a, a big problem. Well, this is uh, an example fairly recent of an antibiotic that um, the stock, of course, tanked terribly for the company. I'll, I'll just read it. On Thursday, Motif explained it had received the official minutes of its meeting with the FDA, and an additional clinical trial will be needed before granting marketing approval to address continued concerns of the regulator about liver toxicity. And if you hit it again, um, there's a thing the FDA has, which is they call the rule of three. Um, and that means that to exclude an event occurring in one in a thousand, they would want to see adequate treatment of 3,000 patients in order to have 85% uh, power to have detected it. So if they're looking for severe liver injury or what's called a Heis Law case, they would want um, you know, three times the uh, the number to uh, detect uh, an event. And if you hit the next slide, that of course costs money, but the major uh, cost to drug companies and society um, is that if a drug attains at least a billion dollars in sales at the end of patent life, uh, and that's a reasonable goal for most drugs that are approved, that means every day you delay an approval is, you know, more than $2 million at uh, stake, assuming revenues um, falls off dramatically for a generic drug, which is the case. Now, most um, executives in companies aren't don't think of it this way because they'll be gone at the end of patent life or, or often, but it, it is the major impact and, and reason to drive up the cost of drugs. That is, the FDA is requiring these large um, trials just to assess uh, liver safety. Next. So this is, I just want to mention that in the liver, a drug-induced liver injury network, uh, antimicrobials are the major cause of uh, idiosyncratic, clinically important liver injury. This is the experience from the U.S. Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network. But if you click it, actually herbal and dietary supplements are a close second. And this is a hot area right now because of certain drugs, uh, certain over-the-counter um, herbal extracts. CBD, cannabidiol, right now is a very hot uh, issue because there's no question in high doses, as was given to these kids with these bad seizure disorders, there's uh, substantial uh, sometimes liver toxicity. Um, and the question is, how safe is this out in the uh, general population? Uh, next slide. And of course, these things are on the market without ever proving their benefit. And I love this uh, slide. Some of you may have seen me show it before. Uh, in only six weeks of drinking fit tea, Robert lost $500, which I think sort of captures some of the concerns, all risk and, and no proven benefit. Next slide. Um, so drug-induced liver injury remains a major problem in drug development. It's driving up the cost, delaying release of new drugs. And herbal and dietary supplements are also now a major uh, contributor to this public health problem. Next, next slide. So what is currently done to assess the safety of new drug candidates? Well, there have been preclinical uh, you know, studies, obviously, is a major uh, uh, effort, you know, before a drug would go into people. And there are now a variety of molecular screening tools, including the humanized liver in a mouse and, um, and uh, spheroids and um, more complex, uh, you know, spheroids that include non-parenchymal cells. Um, and I think that they are in advance. Um, however, um, they've not, in my experience, been preventing surprises when drugs go into the clinic. And then, of course, traditionally, you want a rodent and non-rodent uh, live animal study. Um, and I think they work. You know, I, I think they have kept drugs off the market that um, are out of clinical development that would have been bad news. Uh, but if you click the next slide, it's also clear that um, animal screening is keeping drugs out, out of development that would otherwise be safe. So if you click it again, both the acetaminophen, of course, you know, even in humans at 10 times the dose will predictably cause a severe liver injury and certainly does in, in uh, mice and rats if you give them enough and dog. 
uh, ibuprofen, Motrin, um, you know, something we call in the clinic a vitamin I, because so many people take it every day, um, actually causes kidney and, and liver failure in a dog, even in small amounts. And it's important to know that if you have a dog in the house, if they, they, it can be an extensive uh, uh, hospitalization, actually, for dogs to take it. So those are two very useful drugs, obviously, that in the current preclinical screening would probably never make it into a phase one study, even if the goal was to treat, you know, Alzheimer's disease or inflammatory bowel disease or a significant problem. And there's sort of this myth that in high throughput screening, you've got hundreds and hundreds of drugs. So what does it matter if you, if you drop some that would otherwise be safe? But in my experience, once you get into the right properties of drugs and you get down to the list of things that you want to advance to uh, the clinic, there aren't a, it's not a big list, and you certainly don't want to unnecessarily be dropping uh, new drug candidates that would, in fact, be efficacious and say, next. Uh, um, so then, of course, clinical trials then is where you really where the rubber meets the road, and you see whether um, the preclinical screening was effective and what sort of liver liabilities exist or don't exist. Next slide. And um, the the blood. A biomarker, the blood test that is universally used as the most sensitive and specific in clinical trials to detect liver injury is serum, serum alanine immunotransferase. And this is a protein that's present inside liver cells. So some of it naturally gets in the blood as liver cells turn over and die or, or leak. Um, and that's why there's a normal range in, in everyone's blood. But elevations um, it are essentially liver specific if there's no muscle injury. And certainly over three times the upper limit of normal, you're, you're talking about, a, a, in general, a liver-specific event unless there's, uh, again, muscle injury. And in that case, AST and CPK are elevated. Um, so it's, it's usually not a diagnostic challenge if you have measured CPK and AST. Next. Okay. But the problem with ALT as a biomarker is that some drugs cause ALT elevations um, frequent and actually quite um, pronounced, uh, even in healthy volunteers, but yet have been rarely associated with significant liver injury. And statins, of course, there was a huge concern of statins when they were introduced, uh, monitoring requirements that have all but left now. Um, there's no question statins can very rarely cause someone to develop a clinically important liver injury, but it's extraordinarily rare, and routine monitoring is not recommended. Cholestyramine, which isn't even absorbed, and probably is depletion of bile acids with a reflex synthesis of bile acids in, in the liver. Um, you know, we've published pretty remarkable ALT elevations in healthy volunteers given cholestyramine. Heparin's really no serious liver injuries recorded with heparin. And Tacrin is sort of the classic poster child of a drug that caused remarkable incidence of ALT elevations, treating Alzheimer's disease. It was a cholinesterase inhibitor, and initially was improved with a monitoring every two weeks. So you had to get, you know, grandma with Alzheimer's disease down the icy steps in winter to get blood drawn. And it turned out that was, as best we can tell, all smoke and no fire, or as the famous High Zimmerman said, a dog that barks and doesn't bite. But these are examples of drugs that if you were developing them early on, you would be very concerned about liver safety and you might stop development um, depending on what the indication was. And yet, as it's turned out, they have very little um, liver safety liability um, when taken as directed. Um, hit it again. And the other confusing thing is that um, if, even if you have a drug that can cause liver failure, so isoniazid would be a good example, and it was the case with troglitazone and TAC-875 and uh, tolvaptan and a, a whole list of drugs that we now know can cause severe liver injury um, and, uh, you know, in some cases, liver failure, that they cause ALT elevations in a much larger percent of the population and they're benign, they go away, even if you continue to treat with the drug in this process called adaptation. And this has created a dilemma because um, you know that a drug, you prefer a drug not cause ALT elevations, then you don't have a problem. But if your drug is causing ALT elevations, it is very common 
Um, the only way currently to tell whether those are sort of benign elevations, sometimes referred to as transaminitis, or whether they portend the potential for progressive and serious liver injury is to keep treating. And that is the current FDA, it's still the current 2009 guidance. I say if your drug causes ALT elevation, as long as they're asymptomatic, keep treating to see if they start getting sick, if they get into trouble. Next slide. So that's the question, how do you tell benign from a serious ALT elevation? And the thing is to continue to treat to see if global dysfunction occurs, and that's assessed with the blood test bilirubin. In other words, when you have ALT elevations, you begin to see bilirubin rise to greater than two times the upper limit of normal. And that's referred to as a Heis law case after the famous Heis Zimmerman. Hit it again. But, you know, large clinical trials may be necessary then to define this risk because you're talking about something ALT elevations may be common, but serious liver injury may be quite rare, but still unacceptable for the drug, at least in the FDA's opinion, relative to the benefit. Hit it again. So what the way the FDA does it, this is really the brilliance of John Sr. and a statistician, Ted Guo at the FDA said, well, if really all you're interested in is ALT, serum ALT, and serum bilirubin, um, that should be the first thing you look at. So what's shown here is what's called an EDISH plot. That's Evaluation of Drug-Induced Serious Hepatotoxicity, where for every patient in the clinical trial, which is a symbol, the peak serum ALT that was recorded is shown on the x-axis, and the peak serum bilirubin that was achieved is shown on the y-axis. Now, in this case, this is actually the Yiddish plot for zymelagatrin, um, the oral anticoagulant that was approved worldwide, but then withdrawn from the market. And this was a retrospective analysis. So you can see that drug X, which is zymelagatrin, is the red triangles. And drug C, uh, which actually was Coumadin or Warfarin in this case, which is not, uh, does not have a significant liver safety liability, is shown as the green circles. And basically, everybody starts because of exclusion criteria in the left lower quadrant. That is, their serum ALT is less than three times the upper limit of normal, again, on the log scale on the x-axis. And their peak serum bilirubin is less than two times the upper limit of normal, depending on the entrance criteria and, and the disease you're treating. But then, what happens is, um, and this is the software will do this now, um, uh, Jump Clinical, for instance, uh, and other programs in a clinical trial will actually allow you to monitor on a regular basis what the peak serum ALT and peak bilirubin is in the population. And if everyone starts in the left lower quadrant, what you can see is there's now a migration of some patients into the right lower quadrant. This is called the Temple's Corollary Range because Bob Temple, Guy who's very influential at the FDA, been there a long time, was the one that first made the observation is drugs that cause serious liver injury cause ALT elevations in a larger percent. So he says, if you don't have ALT elevations greater than three times the upper limit of normal, you don't have a problem. And claims this has been pretty uniformly um, true as they even go back and look at former databases. Again, pointing out you ideally don't want a drug that will cause ALT elevations greater than three times the upper limit of normal. But then the majority of these patients, if you click it again, uh, that go into the Temple's corollary range, again, have a ALT greater than three times the upper limit of normal, but normal bilirubin, will actually drift back over time. And, and if you hit it again, this is this adaptation that occurs. Now, that could be because they exceeded the threshold of protocol driven for stopping the drug. But it is also true even if you don't stop the drug in most patients, even with drugs that are capable of causing progressive and clinically important liver injury. So if you click it again, then what the FDA is saying is continue to treat, hit it again, and see whether any of those patients start having signs of global liver dysfunction, that is the rise in serum bilirubin. Now, 
there could be other reasons why someone would appear in the right upper quadrant. Um, it could be they passed a gallstone, they developed viral hepatitis, but this eDish software allows you to take your mouse and click on a little triangle and actually see more information about that patient, including the serial liver chemistries as a function of time. And this is not available um, through the FDA, and there's a long story behind that, but actually there is now a public um, with publicly available open source eDish software that, that is available and you can just Google uh, eDish and, and get it and, and actually add data and play around with it. Um, so next slide. So this is an example of a patient that started out, so this is a study day on the x-axis, starting drug on uh, day zero, and then this is the liver test value um, uh, you know, and we have ALT, which we talked about, total bilirubin there, but also aspartate aminotransferase and alkaline phosphatase. Uh, those are the four traditional liver tests done in a clinical trial. And what you can see, they're expressed as fold upper limits of normal on a log scale, is that all four values started out before day zero in the normal range. And actually at day 30, they were in the normal range. And at day 45, they were in the normal range. So this is typical for this idiosyncratic hepatotoxicity. But then at two months, the ALT and ASD started to rise. Alphos and, and uh, bilirubin were normal. But the peak ALT, for instance, is not even three times the upper limit of normal. If there's a log scale here, I don't know if you can see across there. So there wouldn't be any protocol that I know of, that, at least typical protocol, that would stop treatment at that. Uh, on a clinically significant ALT. But then now at, at three months, the ALT ASD are towering. This is because liver cells are bursting open, releasing their contents in the blood that is undergoing necrosis. And um, the drug was stopped. But in spite of stopping the drug, there was a progression. ALT ASD got higher for a couple of weeks, but then started to come back down. You might have thought the patient was getting better, but in fact, the serum bilirubin in green was rising. And so this patient became a high slot case. If you click it again, I think that'll come in. Um, yeah, so it became a high slot case when the bilirubin, that is the green triangle, went over two times the upper limit of normal. And the scary thing is, this, this guy didn't become a high slot case until after they stopped the drug a couple of weeks. So there's the current process of saying, if you see ALP elevations, continue to treat the drug until uh, the bilirubin rises. Um, is putting people in jeopardy in clinical trials. And the FDA is aware of this, and the question is, should you go in and reconsent them once their ALT goes up? And, and, the, and no one wants to talk about it very much, but the idea is we're just in the unfortunate state where we have no ability to um, identify drugs with this idiosyncratic liability currently, except to do these trials and let people you know, start to get sick. Um, and it may not be in that individual patient's best interest, but it's definitely in the public's best interest, and it's the only thing we've got. A lot of work being done now to try to identify um, biomarkers that prior, in this case, prior to day 90, would have predicted the course. That's what TransBioLens are doing in uh, Europe. We're partnering with them, the Dillon Network. Um, and uh, it, But it's still an area of, with a lot of work needing to be done. Next slide. I'll finish up soon here. So um, current clinical trial guidelines regarding delayed potential demand large clinical trials and are putting some patients at risk. Next slide. So uh, DILISEM initiative, you know, I got involved with this in my institute um, because I, I was um, part of an advisory committee that started looking at this QSP, QSP, and I realized it was a great way to prioritize research because it becomes clear where the data gaps are. And it's really taken off. We've got a wonderful advisory board. We just added Frank Sestere, who's been a giant in industry, just left Merck in retirement, moved actually to my town, Chapel Hill. And I'm delighted he's come on board. And uh, it really started in 2011. And um, if you're interested in a review, I wrote one in Clinical Translational Sciences, really about the uh, novel insights into mechanisms underlying uh, liver uh, drug-induced liver disease. The FDA has been a supporter from the beginning. They have supported full-time, um, uh, well, uh, supported members of the modeling team through their fellowship, and uh, there have been at least 26 cases now where 
modeling has been used in communications with um, uh, you know the FDA and regulatory submissions. Next slide. So, um, and the FDA actually has a license for the software, which they've uh, just renewed in their pharmacometrics uh, division. Um, next slide. So, I mean, what DILISIM actually does is predict exposure-dependent toxicity. And what I've been talking about as a big problem clinically is idiosyncratic liver toxicity. Um, and, and does DILISIM predict this? Next slide. <clears throat> And uh, Lisa will go into this in more depth. But, you know, the idea is obviously you need to have a drug exposure, no drug, no toxicity. And there's more and more evidence that these delayed toxic events, uh, Dilly events, that are sudden, actually reflect an adaptive immune attack on the liver. But if you hit it again, hit the, click the mouse again. Um, and this is an example. This is actually Tolvaptan, which is a first-in-class drug that Lisa was going to talk about, Lexivaptan modeled very nicely in uh, Dilisim as uh, having liver liabilities. Um, but you can see here, again, the days on drug on the x-axis pulled up for limits of normal on the y-axis, that this event started after about five months, four or five months on drug. Drug was stopped, that's the gray box stop, then progressed along. Fortunately, this person didn't become a high slot case, got better, and at this point, they couldn't believe it was the drug, so they gave it again. And, happened right away. I mean, this is so it's clearly this, in my mind, this is an adaptive immune attack on the liver. So why did Dilisim model the liver liability for this drug? Oh, because Dilisim doesn't yet have the adaptive immune response. And that's because we're, we think, that, you know, and I think there's general consensus that you don't get an adaptive attack on the liver unless you have stress in the hepatocyte, if you hit it again, and you have then release of damage associated molecular patterns and get inflammation or innate response in the liver and click that again. And this is basically uh, what Dilisim models so far, although Lisa's working on the adaptive immune attack. But the point is, if you don't have this, you shouldn't have this. And so far, um, you know, this is the, the sort of accepted uh, thought, and I, 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 so far things seem to be right. In fact, there's a publication which just got accepted to um, Toxi, I looked today to see if it's online, where it showed that um, uh, Dilisem predicted that Ubrojapan, the new migraine GCRP drug, which just got approved without a liver safety warning, would be safe, whereas Talgadjapan and MK3207 um, were modeled in Dilisem as, uh, as um, having liver supply ability. And at least with Talgadjapan, the toxicity was a delayed toxicity, and in my mind, likely to have been immune mediated. So I think the modeling uh, is relevant. And if you click to the next slide, um, yeah. So in other words, if you don't go into the right lower quadrant, you shouldn't have this problem. And that's what I think uh, Dilly Sim is modeling. So you can go to the next slide. I got to give Liesl some time. So I'm going to stop now. And I think the plan was for uh, questions at the end. Because yep, people that's are right. writing in questions. Okay. Lisa. So, uh, Lisa, take it away. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, next, please. So, um, just to give maybe a little bit more on um, what Paul had uh, just reviewed. So, this is the schematic that he had um, shown previously, and I just wanted to um, sort of explicitly lay out what DILISIM currently includes. And so, DILISIM, um, what DILISIM includes is indicated on the um, above the, the schematic shown previously. So um, DILISIM does include a, a PBPK model, but since joining the Simulations Plus family, um, we've been leveraging the expertise um, in PBPK modeling by a GastroPlus um, to take care of our exposure piece. And then as Paul indicated, we have these intermediate pieces that contribute to liver injury. To add just a little bit more granularity to that, what we're including is drug intrinsic um, toxicity via three um, mechanisms of toxicity. And those are um, inhibition of bile acid transporters leading to uh, accumulation, intracellular accumulation of bile acids and hepatocyte death, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, and oxidative stress. And so what we're really looking at is um, the ability of of um, drug exposure to engage these mechanisms leading to hepatocyte death. 
um, that can lead to then release of danger signals and activation of inflammatory cells that engage then the innate immune response. So we can have activation and accumulation of macrophages and neutrophils, um, release of various mediators, including TNF-alpha, which um, can induce uh, hepatocyte cell death. So this is another mechanism by which one can have um, liver injury that can add on top of the uh, drug-dependent intrinsic um, injury. Notably, the drug intrinsic uh, injury needs to come first before you would expect the, um, the amplification effect. And then the last point being that, you know, the innate immune response is not only a, a bad actor, potentially a bad actor in, in liver injury, but it is also pivotal for um, the recovery of the liver. And so uh, there are um, some interesting dynamics to understand that twofold nature of um, the innate immune response. Next, please. So as previously mentioned, um, we are currently working on the representation of the adaptive immune attack, and that includes differences um, that in what is already represented as well as adding new. So in the, in the realm of what's already represented, so we are including um, neoantigen formation that is dependent on drug exposure, antigen presentation, and changes in the liver microenvironment that alter it from a tolerogenic state, which is where um, in normal homeostasis, the idea is the liver is really a tolerogenic environment that allows it to be exposed to a number of um, uh, incidental antigens via exposure from the intestine that one doesn't typically respond to. But in some cases, the liver microenvironment is primed to have a more inflammatory, um, uh, inflammatory response. And so that's one aspect we're looking at. And then on the right-hand side, what we're looking at is adding T cells, adding the ability of T cells to be activated, differentiate to a cytotoxic phenotype, produce mediators, and be able to induce hepatocyte death either directly um, via contact-mediated cytotoxicity or indirectly via mediators. We're also including uh, mechanisms of tolerance. Um, which are going to be important not only in the sense of the this particular idiosyncratic dilly that might be T-cell mediated, but also from the standpoint of um, looking forward to um, other conditions, whether they're autoimmune and perhaps looking into checkpoint inhibitors. Next, please. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to dive into the dilly -SIM software, give you a really brief overview of, of what's represented. We are representing multiple species, so um, mice, rats, dogs, and humans. Um, <clears throat> and this allows us to look at some of those um, points that were raised earlier about you know, whether what's happening in the preclinical situation and how that might differ as one transitions to the clinic. We're representing events happening in the three primary ACE ends of the liver, which we um, refer to as periportal, midlobular, and central lobular. And within these zones, we're accounting for the drug exposure and then engagement with these different mechanisms of toxicity, be it oxidative stress, uh, bile acid, transporter inhibition, or mitochondrial dysfunction. The um, <clears throat> model is optimized using exemplar compounds, but then we have the opportunity to test with using compounds that were not used in the optimization. At this point, we've um, done this with over 70 different compounds with an 80% uh, success rate. Next, please. So how do we really pull all this, these different pieces together? Um, it's really looking to simulate um, the, the intersection of these items list, listed on the left. So basically, we are integrating the exposure via PBPK modeling and Gastro Plus. We're taking data on in vitro assays that detail quantitatively the relationship between a compound concentration and these different mechanisms of toxicity. And typically we've done that through um, longstanding now associations with a couple of providers, Salvo and Ciprotax, um, and well-characterized assay systems. And so we take those in vitro assay data 
and translate those into parameter values that can now interact with the exposure that we're getting from the PPPK model. And we're simulating that in different simulated patients. So what we do is we have um, parameter variability that represents different patients. And we do that all within the context of DILISIM in order to have um, simulated frequency and severity of liver injury. And once one encounters that simulated um, liver injury, you can then deconvolute it. So to understand, for example, which of these mechanisms are driving um, the simulated liver injury, um, how sensitive is it to changes in the dosing protocol, et cetera. Next, please. So we, um, whenever possible, we are looking to share our findings and um, our, our learnings with the scientific community. What's shown on this page is a few of our recent examples. And at this point, I know I've only given like the 70,000 foot view, but I do want to run into through a couple of case studies um, to illustrate sort of what DILISIM has done in the application space. Next, please. So the first example is a 2020 publication looking at um, compound effects in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Next, please. So the compound in, of interest is lixivaptin. Lixivaptin is a vasopressin B2 receptor antagonist acquired by Palladio Biosciences. And the idea was to take this compound and, and position it for autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Next, please. So Lixivaptin is a next-in-class compound. Um, tolvaptin, which Dr. Watkins referred to earlier, um, <clears throat> is an approved compound in the same class. Um, we should be on slide 41. And it um, <clears throat> that had um, uh, no uh, evidence of liver injury in patients treating for hyponatremia. But when tolvaptin was taken into ADPKD patients, there were um, some instances of, of liver safety. And so the question was, will this be the same for lixivaptin? Lixivaptin similarly had no DILI signals in hyponatremia, but now we're taking it to ADPKD. And the idea was then to use DILI-SIM to address this. Next, please. So uh, in order to do this, there was a representation of the exposure via PVPK modeling. There was also the um, detailed uh, in vitro assays to look at the interaction of the compound with these different mechanisms of toxicity. So this slide is a little bit busy, but what if we focused initially on the far left um, column, we're looking at the three main mechanisms represented currently in DILISIM. So that's mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, and bile acid transporter inhibition. And um, if we look a few columns over, we can see lixivaptin. So that's the parent compound, which we were able to run through these, these assay systems to look for the interaction with these different mechanisms, but also three metabolites of lixivaptin, so that we really had sort of our best um, evidence to populate DILISIM with respect to the ways in which um, lixivaptin or its known metabolites could interact with these different mechanisms um, of toxicity. And um, these are going to be compared then against tolvaptin. Tolvaptin had also been represented in DILISIM in earlier work, and that work has also been published. Next, please. So the lixivaptin simulations were done in a simulated population of 285 individuals. Uh, we initially looked at simulations using 100 milligram BIDs for 60 days um, and saw no uh, evidence of liver uh, injury, no ALT elevations. And that was consistent with data that were in hand um, for this lower dose. And so no evidence at 100 milligrams BID, but that wasn't the protocol that was intended for the ADPKD population. For the ADPKD, we're looking at 200, 100 uh, milligram split daily dosing for 12 weeks. And so this was then simulated and in this um, N of 285 simulated individuals. And the E-dish plot is shown on the right um, for this result. And as uh, Dr. Watkins had um, 
discuss, the, this bottom left quadrant is um, in the, the normal range, uh, what is considered the normal range or within the upper limits of the normal range. And these 285 individuals are then clustered within that section, um, suggesting that um, uh, elixivaptin would not, given this clinical protocol, would not be anticipated to have um, liver signals due to mitochondrial dysfunction, bile acid transporter emission, or oxidative stress. Next, please. So these results were included with the weight of evidence in discussions between Palladio Biosciences and the FDA and led to the um, approval to um, begin a phase two clinical trial with Lixivaptin and ADPKD. And so these efforts are ongoing and, and we're certainly looking forward to the results. Okay, I want to quickly shift gears to a different case study, um, also published fairly recently. So whereas Lixivaptin was sort of prospective, right, the clinical trial had not been initiated yet, we we're looking to see you know, whether one might expect liver injury. In this particular case, where this is a retrospective study, um, looking at um, where there was evidence of um, signals in people, um, normal healthy uh, volunteers, but there hadn't been um, uh, evidence in the preclinical species. Next, please. So to sort of detail this out just a little bit more, the compound TF04895162 was in development for epilepsy. Preclinical um, studies were clean. There were early clinical trials. Those were also clean. Um, and then uh, they got to a trial where um, People were administered 300 milligram BID for 14 days, and um, ALT elevations were observed, not terribly high, but um, relatively frequent ALT elevations were observed, and that halted development. So then the question became, you know, can the mechanisms represented within DILIFIM account for those observed species differences? Next, please. So similar to what we did for Lixivaptin, there's an effort to um, do in vitro assays that can inform the representation, this time in both human and in rats, um, within Dilysim. Um, again, this is a busy slide, but what we're looking at on the left are the in vitro data for um, the interaction between 162 at different concentrations and human bile acid transporters. And on the right are, again, the interaction between the compound and rat transporters. And we can use these data to identify the ability of the, the exposure dependent ability of the um, compound to inhibit the transporters and incorporate that in Dilysium. Next, please. Similar effort uh, to assess mitochondrial dysfunction. So these are um, results taken from um, a seahorse assay to look at the interaction between different concentrations of 162 and um, mitochondrial function as defined by oxygen consumption rate, or OCR. Um, the, uh, I didn't mention on the previous slide, but I should have. Um, the interaction of the compound with the bile acid transporters was relatively weak, high IC50s that, are general, uh, that were, I believe, all over 100 micromolar. And the same was true when we were looking in human hepatocytes and rat hepatocytes at the mitochondrial effects. Again, these were very modest differences that um, you know, by themselves did not look terribly um, uh, concerning. Next, please. So then we combine this um, in, um, in Dilysim with the exposure and the protocols of interest. So on the left, we're looking at 300 milligram BID for 14 days followed by 14 day follow-up, and that's in the simulations. And in this EDISH plot, which represents 285 simulated patients, we can see that, you know, in contrast to what we're looking at with Lixivaptin, now we see a, a spectrum of response stretching into Temple's corollary range, um, the lower right quadrant, which indicates um, simulated individuals with ALT greater than three times the upper limit of normal, 
and even into the high law range where there was also indication of um, compromised liver function based on an increase in total bilirubin. So, and, and this contrasts with what we see on the right, which is the rat simulations. So this is um, simulated rats given 100 milligrams per kilogram of the compound per day for 28 days. And these 294 simulated rats are all clustered in that bottom left quadrant. Um, indicating that uh, no toxicity was expected. So what we had here then was the um, ability to reproduce the species dependent differences, although not perfectly because the simulations um, had a lower frequency and higher severity than was seen in the, in the small clinical trial that stopped development. Next, please. So, as mentioned sort of in the beginning, when we have a toxicity, we can dig deeper to understand what was driving the toxicity. Um, the table at the top is essentially going through and, and uh, testing whether if you pull a particular mechanism off, how that affects the toxicity. And this was actually done in a smaller, what we call a sim cohort, but a cohort of 16 simulated patients when um, we ran, three, this, and this is of course humans, where we saw the simulated toxicity. So when we run 300 milligram BID for 14 days in a, sim, in a cohort of 16, eight of the individuals had ALT elevations greater than three times the upper limit of normal. If we remove the interaction between the compound and bile acid transporters, the ALT elevations go away. If we remove the interaction with mitochondrial dysfunction, the ALT elevations go away. And so this was really indicative that um, it required the combination of the two interaction with both mechanisms to see the toxicity. Um, and then the last point to make is on the bottom where um, in the clinical data, the ALT elevations were somewhat delayed, um, median value of 16 days. In the simulations, the ALT elevation, peak ALT elevations were also delayed um, a little over two weeks. And so, you know, this is not ideally uh, in terms of T cell mediated delay or something that wasn't understood. We, under, we think we understand what can account for the mechanisms, at least partially. Um, but this is an instance where a delayed effect can be seen based even on these intrinsic mechanisms. Next, please. Okay, so I mean, this was really a, the opportunity to see how um, different mechanisms can go together to simulate um, hepatotoxicity and the, and the um, opportunity to look at retrospective learning. Next, please. So one other thing that we are um, hearing increasingly from um, collaborators is an interest in understanding um, the combinatorics of different drugs. And what we can see here is on the top in the, with the orange arrows, there's a possibility that one is looking at um, two drugs that perhaps um, both are thought to perhaps um, uh, induce oxidative stress. And the question is, if you put those two drugs together, does that now create a liver um, safety liability that didn't exist with the drugs alone? On the bottom, we have a, um, in a situation where you've got two drugs uh, and potentially it could even be a metabolite that are hitting different mechanisms. And so within Dilysim, this really gives a systematic way to sort of address the potential of these in a way that is quantitative and, and systematic. Next, please. So um, as mentioned earlier, the Dilysim development is really driven by the Dilysim initiative um, that is uh, comprised of multiple uh, companies that um, uh, contribute their ideas, their efforts, as well as the funding. And um, we are currently um, uh, working towards opening stage four of the membership, which includes a number of benefits, but um, also includes uh, membership in the Renasim Consortium, which is our new effort to look at um, drug-induced kidney injury. Next, please. And um, finally, I just wanted to uh, briefly mention that Dilysim is 
um, getting set to launch a new version of Daily Sim called Daily Sim X. It's much faster. It um, also does not rely on MATLAB or um, MATLAB runtime. And so it has um, perhaps a, a, a lower footprint, I guess, within um, in terms of the, the requirements for the system. Um, it will also include multiple new compounds um, and will hopefully um, really facilitate um, the ability to run um, you know, more simulations, be more systematic, consider it in, to be um, uh, um, more integrated within the system. So with that, if there are um, folks within the audience, if you have an interest in Dilly Sim X and, or in joining the initiative, um, we're going to launch a quick poll to see so that you can have the opportunity to indicate your interest, um, and then we'll move to questions. Okay, thank you, Liesl. Um, you launching the poll? All right. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, we will now move to the live questions from the audience um, section. We have just a couple minutes for questions, and I, I think um, we have a few questions that have come in via uh, the chat. If you do have questions, please send those in via the questions box, um, and we will take those. Alternatively, you can raise your hand, and we will um, call on you there. So. Uh, the first question is, did the Pfizer compound um, 5162, did it have any liver accumulation or active liver uptake? That one is so, to you, Liesl. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, there was um, evidence of um, uh, liver accumulation. This was actually, um, this project was, was initially done quite a while ago, and it was actually one of the first projects where we really saw the importance of considering liver concentrations um, at the site of toxicity. So we had initially, um, looking at those in vitro assays, sort of considered the, the nominal media concentration. So what you're sort of, you know, if you are intending to add 100 micromole. And then, you know, with that assay, the question became, well, do we expect that you know, concentration to really reflect what is happening in the liver. Um, and as we, you know, dug into that deeper, we really identified that, yes, there was evidence of, of um, uh, that there could be accumulation, and we were able to verify that in the um, in assays and the measured data. Um, we also sometimes use the um, whole body autoradiography data to sort of give us an idea about whether we would anticipate that in vivo. Um, and in, in both of those cases, that was um, part of the equation. Thank you, Liesl. We had another question about um, receiving a trial version. Uh, just you know, contact us, and uh, we will get you information about how to uh, receive a trial and the details around the availability of trial versions. Um, another question for you, Liesl. Uh, was there was was there any potential synergistic mitotox of the accumulated bile acids and the parent compound within the Pfizer example? So I guess the question is more to speaking to the, the details around why there was, um, you know, some synergy between those two mechanisms. Yeah, so there was definitely a, a combination of effects and, and, and those um, two pathways do sort of intersect mechanistically within Dilysim at the level of the mitochondria. Um, but it's not sort of um, an immediate effect. It really is somewhat dependent on how much intracellular bile acid accumulation um, is, is obtained and in that time frame. So uh, the delay that we saw in terms of the, the hepatotoxicity was really dependent on um, the time frame for bile acid accumulation. 
and then engaging with that ongoing mitochondrial stress or insult, um, and then the two together manifesting as um, sufficient hit to induce hepatocyte death. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think we're out of time, and we'll turn it back to you, Arlene. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's call. We encourage you to attend next week's live stream learning event, where Brett will continue the conversation on modeling DILI drug-drug interactions with DILI-SIM software. You can register for the virtual event on our website. And as always, if there's anything our team can do to help, please don't hesitate to reach out. This now concludes today's webinar, and if you missed any part of today's presentation, the replay will be available at www.simulations-plus.com. Thank you.